It's the second uh, appointment of this uh, new initiative that we call mm -hmm. it, uh, we hear from the CLT because, uh, you know, the, the aim of this initiative is to promote uh, reciprocal knowledge and, and future collaboration within the network. And so today I'm particularly pleased because, uh, you know, the, the speaker today is a new member of this community. This Professor Gregor Schellner, in fact, he, he, you know, joined the, joined the community as a new representative member from uh, University of Bochum. And uh, so that's, uh, this, this is our speaker today. So Professor uh, uh, Schreiner holds a PhD in theoretical physics, as I, as I do. So, I'm, you know, we are colleagues in this respect uh, from the University of Stuttgart. Stuttgart. Then he moved uh, uh, to uh, Florida as a, you know, as a postdoc, I assume that, uh, you know, for, uh, um, and then, there he got uh, acquainted with, uh, with his, uh, I think, uh, activities on, on neuroscience, the first exposure on neuroscience. Then uh, uh, he, he first returned to, for, 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 for the first stint at University of Bochum uh, for a short period. Then he moved for, for, a long, for a longer period to Marseille like in France as a, a CNRS. Until uh, he eventually he he he, 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 he turned, you know came back uh, to Germany he, he went back to Germany and and, and uh, where he's now professor uh, uh, in uh, in uh, at the Department of Physics so and uh, and I'm particularly pleased also because uh, you know he's uh, you know working in neuroscience in general or in cognitive science and uh, you know we have uh, uh, recently the, you know. Um, establish a new research unit on that. So, you know, I think uh, and this is coordinated by Bea de Gelder, who is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, attending mm -hmm. the seminar. So, uh, with that, that said, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll uh, you know, um, give the floor to uh, Professor Schrede. Thanks so for being with us uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, look forward to your talk. You know, it, it is, let me just mention to everyone that, you know, it's, we, we do encourage questions as, you know, as I mentioned last time, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, in order to, to, to get organized, please uh, uh, use the, the, if you wanted to, uh, to, to ask a question to the, the talk, please use the chat. So I will, uh, and uh, until that time, and then I will, uh, uh, um, I will mention this to, to Professor Schroeder in such a way that he knows that, uh, you know, he, he's going to have a questions. Until that time, please keep, keep the, the microphone in, on the mute mode, because otherwise we don't, we don't, so we don't hear, you know, background noises. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. I'm really interested in this network. I've looked around the web page. Um, uh, it's still my first chance to interact with some of you. So I'm, I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully this should have worked. And I'm showing you my slides here. I think you should have perhaps have my slides now. I'm going to watch off to the side where my slides are. Don't feel sorry about that. So, um, I'm not going to read the title to you. In fact, I wanted to first say a few things about the institution I'm from, uh, I, because I'm, I'm new. I'm a, the new representative of the Ruhr University. I understand uh, formerly uh, one of our colleagues from computational chemistry uh, was part of this. We are quite different, although we overlap. So with the Institute for Neurocomputation, in German, we call that Neuroinformatik. In English, this has a slightly different connotation. So we're not so much about neural data and analyzing neural data in some kind of statistical sense. We're really more about understanding how the nervous system works, both artificial nervous systems and, um, and, and real nervous systems. So we're at the interface between uh, neuroscience, cognitive science, psychology at the one end, and then the technical areas, machine learning, computer vision, and robotics at the other end. And, and we'll try to, to spread to span that whole interdisciplinary spectrum. We, we're a central research institute of the Ruhr University. I'm a member of uh, the physics department and the electric engineering department as a joint appointment, but we're actually outside the departmental structure, which is actually you know, on purpose to accommodate that very interdisciplinary uh, profile we have. And so our technique has been for many years, we've been in existence for about 25 years now, is to um, have research groups in the different subdisciplines. So for instance, here we have a uh, neurophysiological group. We do animal experiments uh, in-house using optical methods. Voltage-sensitive dye imaging is a method to actually observe directly. And I just see that my colleague von der just joined us, who uh, was a, a former director of this institute some, for, for many years, one of the founding directors of this institute. So, uh, hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Glad to uh, hear you. 
<laughs> nice to hear you too. So uh, this is sort of the biological end of things. Uh, I myself am close to that in the sense, I have actually collaborated with neurophysiologists on some of my methods and then uh, also work on human experiments, psychophysical experiments. But my main emphasis is on theory, the theory of human cognition, very related to movement. That's what I'll be talking about today. And I also do sometimes demonstrations of our systems on robots. I'll just very briefly hint at that. Then we have a, a number of people who are much more theoretical and then also oriented to technical applications. Lawrence Viscott, uh, it's the chair of Neural Systems, is actually a former student of uh, Professor Rodo Malzburg, who just joined us. Uh, and he works on uh, neural systems in a more theoretical sense, self-organization, machine learning. He has contributed to uh, uh, object recognition, face recognition with von der Malzburg. And he's uh, since worked in working on slow feature analysis, for instance, and more recently interested in memory. Sen Sheng heads a group on computational neuroscience, primarily interested in mechanisms of learning and memory and works at a more mechanistic, you know, spiking neural network kind of level. And then we have Tobias Lasmachers, who is heading a, a group on uh, the theory of machine learning. His main interest right now is reinforcement learning, where he uses neural networks to make it model-based. Uh, he also uses uh, evolutionary algorithms in, in mostly in applied work now. So that's a bit of our spectrum. We actually have two other groups who are sort of in grounding in, in being uh, founded on, on more applied topics. We teach in a, a very broad uh, area. So our own program is really machine learning, primarily neural networks, autonomous robotics, neural dynamics. Uh, but then we coordinate a degree program that involves essentially all the engineering faculties mathematics, linguistics, bioinformatics, and even econo economics or economical science. Um, and the idea is that people learn computer science techniques, but they also really learn this interdisciplinary style of interacting with different disciplines. So much about our, uh, the, the background, our setting. Uh, now, my own interest is really understanding cognition and understanding it really in a way that is, um, consistent with what we know about the evolution of the nervous system and about the development of individuals, namely that it is very much grounded in sensory motor processing. So I'm often showing this picture of my kids uh, playing soccer to highlight that even an activity like that entails pretty much all cognition that we know of. It entails, of course, you know, attention, uh, controlling gaze, co controlling attention it involves active perception sampling the environment by uh, uh, gaze. Uh, for that, you need working memory. If you want to look up things in the world, you have to, can do that efficiently only if you have some form of working memory. It involves, of course, uh, plans, decisions, sequential actions, has overall some form of goal orientation. There could even be strategies, maybe not yet this very simple form of soccer. And then, of course, it involves motor control, which is uh, also very integrative. That is, you need to integrate a lot of different constraints, perception, uh, different commands on uh, movement, like you know, posture and initiation of, of an action and termination, updating and so on. It, it involves um, background knowledge, the classical problem of AI, not just background knowledge you know, about the rules of the game, but subtle uh, embodied background knowledge, like how slippery the ground is or how hard can you tackle someone and and things like that. And then it in, involves learning and, and it involves autonomous learning from experience. You can't even prevent yourself as a human being from getting better as you do this uh, repeatedly at all, at all levels, from sensory motor all the way to your strategies. So it's actually a very good model system of cognition in a sense. It's good because it captures constraints, properties of, uh, of the underlying neural processes that we believe um, are pervasive in all of cognition. So for instance, it means that you have graded state variables in there. It's, it's not, um, op, you know, not in an obvious way, discrete or symbolic in, in nature. It, it involves continuous time, it involves um, the continuous or intermittent link to sensory motor processes when you look or when you act. And therefore it asks the question how discrete events when you make a decision or you know, categorical behavior emerge from that continuity rather than just postulating that that it's there as a lot of classical condition does. And it always emerges in closed loop with the environment. Um, one 
concrete prerequisite, as every engineer will know, is that if you do things like that, you need stability. So it's a property of, uh, of uh, motor processes to have stable states as functional states rather than transients. And that um, has a lot of implications. So that means that uh, ultimately uh, you re it requires dynamics. And I'll argue a little bit about that. Uh, dynamical systems are really the language in terms of which stability makes sense. And our positive is that cognitive processes inherit these properties. So when we talk about embodied cognition or the embodiment hypothesis, it's not so much as has sometimes been argued that when you think that you also, you know, always sort of activate the motor system. That sometimes happens a little bit, but that's sort of a minor side effect of this. It's actually really that the properties of sensory motor processes that are just listed are inherited by cognitive processes that they also have properties like that. So I, I, today I want to uh, just give you a little bit of flavor how mathematical models of, of sensory motor origin uh, can reach relatively high level cognition. I mean, this is still going to give you moderate uh, level co of cognition compared to applied things like you know, pedagogy or things like that. Um, but it's, it's only moving away from sensory motor. So that's, that's a little bit my goal today. So I want to remind you, I mean, I assume everyone knows about neural networks roughly and, and basic concepts. So um, just want to essentially quickly outline what neural dynamics means. So you know neural networks abstract from the physiology by saying neurons integrate some kind of inputs, sum and fire. Uh, there is a nonlinearity in here that the a threshold behavior that if you have uh, inputs that exceed a certain threshold, you get a significant output. It's a, it's a, non, uh, a monotonic threshold function that does that, the sigmoid. You can line them up in networks, uh, for instance, forward networks. And it is through the forward connectivity to some sensory surfaces that individual neurons acquire some meaning. So they, you know, if, if they stand for some feature, some, let's say for retinal space or some orientation, color, or whatever feature you think of, that comes from the fact that from your sensors to that neural network, there is some forward connectivity that extracts these features. In our modeling, we're actually not uh, keeping track of the discrete sampling of such uh, physical dimensions by discrete neurons. We, we smear them out and talk about fields of activation over the dimensions that describe the continuum of possible uh, sensory states, for instance, or possible features. Uh, and it's actually the metrics of these dimensions that uh, often lead to certain signatures and behavior. The same is true on the motor side. On the motor side, you would say if you have some activation in the brain, a population typically, um, and these neurons are connected in a particular way to the motor surface, you know, ultimately typically through the spinal cord and through uh, reflexes that drive the muscles, then uh, these um, neurons stand for particular motor uh, behaviors. Motor behaviors are actually dynamical systems always in some sense. So reflexes, for instance, set up dynamical systems that, that create stable states for the muscles, like postural states, for instance. And in that sense, um, you can represent motor dimensions, right? That's the sens sensory motor interfaces. Now, inside there, when we talk about activation patterns, we're actually not so much emphasizing this feed forward picture that, for instance, deep networks make very popular now. We're actually more interested in activation that arises or persists in the absence of input. Uh, so clearly, when you generate movement, you can do that. You, movement is not just reflexive to some sensory stimulation. You do movement autonomously. In, in uh, cognition, working memory is a famous example. Uh, working memory is activation that sustains even if you remove the input. And of course, a lot of our thinking is like that, that you're generating sequences of thoughts and these sequences are not driven by some, some input. They are autonomously generated in the nervous system. So in terms of neural networks, that means you have to have connectivity that creates the, the activation that doesn't come from the sensory uh, surface. And that's technically speaking recurrence. So this is the simplest form of recurrence, a single neuron exciting itself. And when you have recurrence in neural network, you actually need time. You can no longer Think of the network as input, output as a function of input. You, the, because some of the inputs come from the output. So the, the way to resolve that is to say it's the output at an earlier moment in time that provides the input to then generate the next output. And of course, in, in, in the nervous system and in applications, that time isn't discrete. There's no iteration in the brain, no CPU that 
drive set. Uh, even if you think of spikes that look like discrete events, but they are generally asynchronous. So they sample continuous time. So you really need to think about these, these uh, recurrency occurring in continuous time. And, and then you're in the domain of differential equations. Uh, so you have a continuous activation state. We're talking about a continuous variable that reflects something like membrane potentials of populations of neurons. You can also build the same thing on, on spiking rates. And then uh, this would be sort of a typical form of the dynamical systems these neurons, these populations of neurons um, uh, in, realize. They have this minus U term that anyone who knows a little bit about dynamics recognizes immediately is something responsible for stability. So for instance here, uh, the rate of change against the activation itself has these, these intersections at negative slope. Those are attractor states, stable states, you know, because your negative slope always indicates that if you're to the right, you, know, you decrease, if you're to the left, you increase. And that is something that ultimately comes from the membrane dynamics. So it's inherited by the neural networks from the biophysics of these networks and is very critical to understanding them. While uh, inputs are essentially just contributions to the rate of change in dynamics. So rather than say the output is a function of the input, it's the rate of change of activation that is a function of the input. So when you do this in, in large networks or for us in these fields, the postulate is that we're, we're interested in stable states of activation patterns. So activation patterns that if perturbed by little inputs or by connectivity resist change up to some instabilities that I'll talk about. And for that, you need some form of recurrence in these networks that is in some way regular, that is organized so that certain states are stable. And I'll be only talking about peaks of activation as stable states in low dimensional fields. There are other kinds of attractor states for other topics that are not touched today. For some of you might be familiar with the Hopfield network that has much more uh, differentiated uh, stable states. Uh, so, so peaks of activation over these uh, uh, activation fields, you see examples of that in a moment. Um, they can be stabilized by having local excitatory interaction that keeps the peaks from decaying and global inhibitory interaction of a longer distance that essentially keeps the peaks from, from uh, diffusively spreading. And that's sort of our unit of representation in this language of, uh, and that was, we call this dynamical field theory. Uh, we have published about this quite a lot and I uh, want to take you to this webpage uh, where we have actually a simulator for these fields right here on the top and you can actually play with that yourself very uh, intuitively. And I, I wanted to show you a little bit more rigorous simulator that is here under live simulations one layer field. You can go to that web page and, and play with that yourself. So here the blue line is a field like that. I have some buttons here to um, change parameters. There is a representation of the interaction kernel. So this is a, is a function of distance. So locally positive would mean locally excitatory. And then there's just a little bit of inhibition here on the side and other kernels here, the, this one that have global inhibition where every location will be inhibited. Uh, I wanted to demonstrate to you three instabilities that are really interesting in this field. So here I'll, I'll apply some input, the green line that you saw here behind that's an input, a Gaussian input I apply to the field. And you see now the blue line is on top of the green line. That's the sub-threshold attractor. It's just the output is equal to the input. That's sort of the normal input driven regime of these fields. When I increase that a little bit, then you see the red line that is the sigmoid applied to the field coming up and a peak is growing. And now you see that this peak here has actually more activation than input. The green line is the input, the blue is the, the, the activation. So you have more activation than input. It's the self-excitation pulling the field up. There's a little bit of inhibition here, not so much in this uh, simulation. So the ar arising, this, we call that the detection instability. This is when the field decides that it has significant input. It's a stable state, so if I reduce input a little bit, it stays around even though the other solution is also around. So if I reset the field, I mean that other solutions, the system is bistable there. So you could say it, it decides to detect something and then it stabilizes that detection. And that is actually critical for all I'll be talking about because that is how the larger networks that I'll show you in a moment uh, create events where inside uh, some activity is coupling to each other and then there are discrete events when a detection happens that can be a response to an outside input but also inside the network. And, and that will be how they look like 
algorithms, how they can make sequences of steps uh, and, and create autonomous processing. There's a lower limit to that, the reverse detection instability, when, when I lower this enough, then this peak becomes unstable and ultimately decays. Uh, if I have a global inhibition here in the kernel, I can also get these fields to make selection decisions. So for instance, here I have a second input, but that doesn't induce a peak through competition. And, uh, and this one won because it was active first. There's a limit to that. For instance, I can switch this around and then the system will now stabilize this peak. And you see the, the history matters. Uh, again, you, you stabilize decisions um, against uh, change. And, um, and so that's the second instability. And then I want to show you, uh, well, uh, let me first illustrate working memory. So working memory arises again under appropriate conditions. Uh, I can have a multi-peak working memory. And that would mean that I induce peaks by input, but then they can persist if I remove the input. That's sort of the standard model of working memory. And that's really how uh, in the brain, roughly speaking, during processing the current state is stored for a certain amount of time. A memory like that is, is subject to interference from other inputs. So if I induce another input somewhere, it can, for instance, if I get close enough, it can sort of disturb, you know, delete the, or update the, the former memory. Now, the last thing I want to uh, demonstrate here is, is a subtle point. Uh, and for that, what I'll do is I'll just put a very little bit of input here that you can barely see. I don't I'm playing here with these sliders to get this right. Um, so you can barely see that there's a little bit of input here. Three inputs at these three locations. Uh, I want to make it all the same size right now and maybe make the positions sort of equal. Um, so there's a little bit of inner homogeneity. You can think of that as some reflection of some learning. You barely see it with the naked eye. But now I can actually induce a peak by just giving a global boost to the system. Like a, uh, imagine a input from just a global input to, to the system and it generates a peak. It generates a peak at one of those three locations, most likely the, the ones that I have a little bit more input. So when I reset it, it should ultimately maybe come up in all of those three locations. So the couple of interesting things about that first is it's a full peak in a sense. That, that is the activation in this peak is largely generated by interaction. And um, what that means is that it actually amplifies a small difference, just these small uh, differences in, in input uh, into a major decision. And that's uh, an important constraint. You can imagine that it makes it possible to have very minor traces like memory traces or effects of learning. My colleague from Amazon was very interested for a long time in fast learning. So here you would have a mechanism how you take just a very small change you achieved in a single trial and amplify it into a macroscopic state and then affect the downstream system. It also illustrates how you can get categorical behavior out of this continuum, right? A small homogeneity would generally specify particular states in this space as the one, the states around which you would have um, peaks. That's what I wanted to demonstrate here. Let me come back to my slides. I hope you see that again. Um, so that, that's the language, the theoretical framework that we use. And so the program is now, the, what I was going to do now is just give you a few examples to show how in this language we can see how simple forms of cognition emerge. They're still initially very sensory motor and then they hopefully get a little more abstract. So I'll talk briefly about visual search, how to bring an object into the attention foreground is a prerequisite to any object oriented action really. Um, I'll uh, talk about how sequences arise very briefly, and then I'll talk a little bit about relations, spatial relations, relational thinking, inference, and so on. <clears throat> so uh, the, the attention selection visual search, I can still explain in, in a little more conceptual detail. So that arises um, uh, very generically when you combine different feature dimensions of a different quality. So here I have a feature dimension color represented as hue, a field of a hue, and I have a spatial dimension that will be, for instance, visual space, retinal space. So I'm just taking one dimension, so I can plot it nicely. So this would be uh, responsive to one spatial dimension along the horizontal and the color in there. So if you think of your retina, the retina would produce two dimensional input, for instance, at this location would maybe make some input that's around blue, and at this location would have some input that's green, very simple. Now, if you want to 
visually search for the blue object. You, you say, you know, take the blue cup. Uh, what you could do is from uh, this concept of blue, you could induce a peak of activation in the color field and have that peak make a ridge input into this two-dimensional field. And that ridge input, you could tune parameters so that only where that ridge overlaps with the two-dimensional input from the scene, will the a peak will be formed, the detection instability will be triggered. And then you could project along this axis, this out the location of that, and that's how you would uh, direct your attention, for instance, make a gaze shift to that location or, or uh, you know, reach to that location. Now, that's a very general mechanism that we use in our architecture. So this very low dimension version, a, a complete model of that, that actually models some data, uh, uses um, more complex features. For instance, a camera image is here analyzed into a hue and some orientation features and some size features. So if you think of that in, in, in 2D, you would always have a two dimensional visual array and then a third dimension is that feature. And there's a lot of other infrastructure in this model. And the thing I just explained to you, the selection mechanism now essentially entails sl slices. If you have some Q to the size, let's say a whole slice of activity is uh, boosted and then peaks uh, that match with that slice can be activated and through mechanisms that are a little bit too complex to explain, then you can do uh, search. I, I have some sound on this. Um, so here's a movie. Um, I'll stop that in a moment. It's actually driven off real camera input. Uh, and you see uh, attention selection right here. It has, uh, is currently actually looking at this object. Uh, and it's actually building a working memory of that in, in feature space. So these are many cuts through the two dimensional space. Now it's looking at this object and here, you just saw somebody moving, moved a little um, object in here, right? Uh, somebody, you saw that? Somebody moves in an object and the system is tuned so that it will, after some delay, build a, uh, you know, att attract attention to this location. And it's now looking for a matching object in the scene. So looking for, for this object. And that ultimately will happen through um, essentially that kind of visual search that I was hinting at. That takes a little time. In fact, it will, initially be selecting the wrong object because this is very salient. So it's selecting this one, but it's rejecting that because that didn't really fit. And, and then ultimately we'll, we'll find that. And the remarkable thing about that that I'll explain next is that this is just one big differential equation running. It's not, uh, I'm, I'm making it uh, narrative as if there was some, some thing, you know, step someone first doing this or that, but it's all just the system evolving in time and the instabilities I hinted at are making these discrete events that look like there's a sequence of events, but it's really just emerging from the dynamics. So with these uh, kinds of models, you can do a couple of different things. So one thing is really account for psychophysical data. So for instance, in this recent work, we accounted for how reaction time depends on how many distractor items you have in a task like that. that has a lot more items than the ones I just showed. And then you can do fit data that way. Another way we uh, link to data is um, linking to neural data. So this is for instance from this group in Bochum uh, around Dirk Janke who use uh, optical recording here. This is actual data on visual cortex, some color code for this um, voltage that is being sensed when a uh, different stimuli are moved across the retina of actually in this case a anesthetized cat so it's, it's nothing really very behavioral and then we're, we're using models like that to account for the temporal evolution of activation patterns like that and there's a whole industry of of looking for essentially behavioral or sometimes neural signatures of the mechanisms that we postulate and because these uh, the theories are very constrained by these principles of of homogeneity and stability, uh, we have some predictive strength there. So that, that's sort of our main line in, in cognitive science and psychology. Uh, now, before I show the robotic things, I, I want to briefly explain how this sequence generation works in here. So the sequence generation idea is to, to harness these instabilities so that a, a state can deactivate itself if its condition of satisfaction is uh, fulfilled. So we, we talk about these states as in, intentional states, so it can be a node or can be a peak of activation. And the idea is that they, every state is neurally connected such that it predicts a particular sensory state that would reflect its successful completion. We call that condition of satisfaction inspired by 
John Searle's discourse about intentionality. So uh, that, that prediction alone would not be enough to induce a peak in that field or activate a node. Uh, you would need some inf input from sensors or from other internal uh, connections in the field that overlaps with that prediction and that will then actually indicate that you're done. And then that uh, activation peak will inhibit the original peak and because this uh, system is inhibited, no longer predicts and ex excites that peak, that also decays. So the end product is that these two peaks are gone and then another behavior can come up uh, that is competing maybe with this behavior. So this is, a, this is actually what was underlying the sequences you just saw in that simulation, uh, in, the, in that run of, of visual search. Uh, here's another example, uh, also some complex architecture, which I can't fully explain. It has a, a visual search machine here. It's, it's capable of attending to objects. It has a, um, a movement system, quite a complex system that's also modeled on some behavioral data that accounts for how you move arms to targets. And up here, it has a machinery that harnesses these kind of conditional satisfaction machinery uh, techniques that I just hinted at to make serial order. And so the sort of thing it can do is, for instance, observe different targets being presented and memorize their serial order, the, ser the order in which the colors arise, and then act that out in a scene that is you know, arranged maybe somewhat differently and then uh, move in time uh, to these different targets. This is a very simple simulated um, robotic experiment. And again, the remarkable thing about this is really just that it is just one big dif integral differential equation. It's not a algorithm or any, there's no discrete time in here. It's all just emergent from that system. We sometimes implement that on actual robots. This is an example. The main point of that demonstration was this online updating that even after it started, it can still update its parameters. And uh, again, you know, this as a, as a robotic behavior, this is maybe not impressive per se, but there is no algorithm in here that, uh, you know, says if this, you know, if you see this, do that then and so on. It's all just emergent from one differential equation, in including this little odd movement that we just saw, which is maybe not the right parameters uh, chosen for the, the hand orientation. So we use the robotic demonstration sometimes to essentially as a heuristic tool to find out what we can cover. Do we have an account for all the processes or then he holds a lot of neurally inspired modeling is only for a certain part of the, of the process like in all deep networks, it's essentially just the intelligent filter, input, output, and everything else is done conventionally, non-neurally. And so we're interested in understanding how you can do everything in a neural metaphor. And so the last thing I, I wanna hint at is how you get to higher cognition. So here, the first step is to think about grounding of concepts. So uh, for instance, if you have a phrase like the red to the left of the green, and you see that kind of uh, display, then you as a human are able to say, well, the the red that must be this thing and the green must be that. We call this the target and that the reference. And so the goal of a, a grounding model would be to say, can I have a system that's driven by that input that gets some representation of that phrase and is able to attentionally select the target object and then, uh, or at the same time, attentionally select the reference object. You see here a little um, activity pattern that reflects the to the left of operator, huh? would be roughly in your network that gets input, uh, positive input somewhere here in, in, a, in a cone on the left, and that's modeled on some set of physical data. So I'll, I'll show you an architecture that does that. It looks a bit wild, and I kind of <laughs> explain in detail, but it's all just based on these kind of concepts I just uh, instructed. Uh, it told you about three-dimensional fields, two-dimensional fields, one-dimensional fields, zero-dimensional fields are just these nodes. Uh, just maybe highlight a few things. So we have some nodes, that represent concepts. So these would be color concepts and the color concepts are implemented by projecting onto hue space on color space with the correct connectivity so that you can either activate the node when you see the color or when you uh, have the node activated, you can uh, build a queue for visual search. And they have memory nodes and, and, and so you can store information about um, nodes. And there's something called role filler binding that I'll uh, skip now. This is the visual search machine that we just talked about, the same thing. And then these are spatial relation and movement relation concepts and sort of maybe intuitive that they would have some kind of connectivity pattern that reflects you know, below and to the left of, maybe intuitive what they would be like. They project onto what we call relational fields 
these relational fields represent the visual array in a way that is centered on a potential reference object. Uh, so there's a coordinate transform in here. Neurally, coordinate transform is sort of like what I ex illustrated for the visual search. It's a mapping, a neuron mapping that can be steered by a particular parameter. And there's some well-known solution to that based on gain fields. So here's an example of that kind of architecture grounding the phrase, the red to the left of the green. Let me stop that name here for a moment. See, that, that is a particularly chosen example because you know, the, the red to the left of the green must be this one here that's circled here. Uh, there's another green one, and there's nothing to the left of that, uh, so something to the right of that. And so this actually, when humans do that, they also have to sort of try out different things. You can see that by the fact that the uh, time to make the decision depends on the, the number of distractors, how many you know, misleading reference items you have. And I wanted to illustrate that this system does that kind of hypothesis testing. It in fact has selected as a potential reference this green object here in this field because it's, it's closer to the camera, it's a little larger and has more salience, it's more likely to be uh, selected. And you will see in a moment that it rejects that. It has a, a condition of dissatisfaction field. So it notices in a sense that there is no good target candidate these target candidates don't match the relation, they match the anti-relation. And as a result, this gets inhibited. And then there's an inhibition of return that prevents this from being activated again. And after some time, it finds the correct reference object, this one. And then it's actually also able to find the correct target objects. Uh, so these two targets, and then I, I guess it selects this one, which is the right one, yeah, the one here on the side. So, so this sequence of events again just unfolds from the neurodynamics. And the last step here perhaps is uh, to, uh, to get rid of the perceptual part, right? This was still sensory motor in the sense it's still about perceiving the scene, but you can actually do this purely mentally. The typical task that for instance, uh, uh, some Markus Knauf in uh, Gießen studies is to give people a number of propositions that describe a scene, which you would do when you, you know, talk to each other on the phone. Uh, maybe not quite as boring as, as this, you know, listing certain relationships. And then you can ask people uh, to make inferences. So for instance, you didn't hear about the blue relative to the red, but then you, if you were paying attention, then you would be able to perhaps uh, answer that question. And the neural architecture that does that is essentially the same. It's just a simplified version of what I just showed you, except that now the scene representation is not driven by input. There's no camera input here. It, it, it drives a mental map and is then in return driven by a mental map that you built yourself. And you built it essentially by taking the relationships and from the relationship and the target reference object, uh, building a peak uh, that is then entered into this map. And I just want to illustrate to you how that works here in this little simulation. Oops, sorry. Um, in the simulation, the system has already built a map and I put the labels here just for us to know the built uh, from the relations about the cyan, uh, red and green is built this map. And now it's getting this uh, phrase blue to the right of red. And the, 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 this phrase is encoded by activating nodes that stand for the relation, the color and in the different roles. And what happens as the system unfolds is that it uh, will uh, bring up a peak uh, that represents that uh, object and then we'll try to enter that peak into this mental map. It builds that mental map autonomously. And in fact, actually you see here, it builds it here on the outside, even though the phrase is you know, blue to the right of red, but there is already a green here to the right. And then the field actually sort of just by the metrics of things puts the peak here on the outside. And that actually turns out is what humans do. When you put humans into a situation like that with an ambiguous phrasing, they tend to not disturb the map that you already had and put the new object on the outside. And then you can do inference on a map like that. So after you built the map, you can ask the system, you know, where is the blue relative to the green? And, and that essentially is just using the mental map now in the way we previously used the uh, perceptual input, the scene representation itself. And uh, applying these same operators to that, and then it will ultimately be able to answer, I think here in this case, the answer is to the right, right? The uh, blue relative to the green must be to the right, yes. And I, hopefully this, this note goes on. I mean, <laughs> obviously it, it worked. Uh, and just, yeah, here you see it goes on. So that's the answer to that, right? 
So that's the so, so, sort of style in which we try to, uh, we call that higher cognition, right? It's still modest. We're now into, into chaining such things and looking how you can uh, use grammar and compositionality. And so those who know a little bit of cognition see that's sort of an entry point into what people call higher cognition. So I should conclude um, and say, you know, activation state is attractors in low dimensional fields can be linked to sensory motor surface. So that's where the sensory motor uh, is still um, constrained. But then we're interested in autonomously processing, uh, getting events from these instabilities. And actually the reason why we can build these big architectures is the stability. They, uh, what stability does is it translates into robustness. Uh, dynamical systems people will know that dynamic stability means structural stability. That is, if you change the equation a little bit, the, the attractors will not disappear. You know, unless special case when they're in instability. And, and, and that's how we can couple these different fields and they still retain their properties as, as they're all robust. So the vision of that is that ultimately populations like that might be the basis, you know, the neural dynamics of population might be the basis of, um, of behavior and thinking. So if you, again, to embed that a little bit, if you think of the current interest in, in neural networks, um, would say that is just a very small part of cognition. It's just the you know, intelligent filter input output relationship, but almost all the thinking and, and work uh, moving um, happens without, not driven by input. And uh, it would be this sort of um, mathematics really that would, would describe that. And, and so when we think of uh, neurally inspired intelligence, it's actually in a sense closer to simple manipulation. It's not computational. Uh, not doing that in a competition picture, but it is creating a neural analog of that. Okay, then maybe I should turn back the control here to you guys, and I'm very happy to entertain any questions you have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I, I, th I, I think it was very, very fascinating, and in fact, I'm very instructive, at least to me. I, I really enjoyed this, this talk very much. Thank you. So, uh, I did the uh, if you have questions, please use uh, the chat and then I will uh, send you the mic. <clears throat> Any questions? Uh, I'm, I might be starting myself, you know, with the questions in the sense that, uh, you know, is uh, in, in this uh, differential, uh, you know, integral differential equations, uh, you, you have to do some fine tuning of the parameters, right? So there is not uh, because, you know, I, I have in mind, it's somewhat, uh, you know, it, it, it reminds me, you know, in, in the in the 90s, or, you know, maybe 10 years, 20 years ago, there was this uh, very um, uh, inter large interest in this self-organizing criticality in which the, 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 the criticality emerged from, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. from self was self-tuning to mm -hmm. criticality. Yes. So I was wondering whether there is some sort of uh, connections mm -hmm. with that. Uh, um. Not sure about that. So uh, yes, we that have was, to. That was also uh, differential equations with yes. some parameters that uh, you know. But uh, that yeah. it, it didn't have to do such sub tuning. You know, it was uh, it didn't have to do fine tuning. It, I, very interesting question. You know, uh, so we have to tune the parameters, uh, and the tuning is primarily about being in the di right dynamic regime. So we have different dynamic regimes for the different functions. For instance, uh, are you in a detection kind of regime where the peak depends on input, but you go through detection instability? Do you do selection? Uh, what's your capacity for how many peaks can you have? And uh, working memory or not? Um, and a couple of things like that. And um, in, in practice, uh, when you make a demonstration model like that, actually it is, I mean, it's a lot of work, but it is not very easy complicated, it's not, not uh, the, the models are, so it's not like there's a very small set of primers where the things work. It is because of this, uh, the stability problems, essentially we're having small bifurcation diagrams and you just need to make sure that your system has that bifurcation diagram. And so mm -hmm. it's like a part of qualitative dynamics. In fact, you can use bifurcation theory to sort of say, I want to be around that bifurcation. And uh, the typical constraints that we assume, like uh, uh, certain sigmoid functions and very simple uh, filters, uh, make that these are very um, robust systems. So they, they don't have a lot of other attractors, undesired attractors. So unlike, for instance, um, hop field networks or the more general uh, fully connected networks, they would have a much richer space or is very constrained by these kernels. Uh, 
on the other hand, what, so, so something interesting that we observe. So when, when our robotics people use these things, they have their idea of how to tune that very clean uh, instabilities to get it to be robust. When we try to tune the parameters to account for psychophysical data, we've often been in that kind of situation. It's not like we have a lot of parameters, right? We have a, a lot, few, way fewer parameters than neural networks, who are now millions, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we have through these kernels, the homogeneous assumption, your know, typical fit has four parameters. Mm -hmm. right? This is not, not a lot. Um, and then we often find that the parameter values that are right are such that the system is very close to an instability all the time. Uh, and you can get an intuitive sense for that. You know, if you think about reaction time, if you know about that, you know, if you, as a human, if you vary the number of choices, the probability of choices, the metrics of choices and so on, then you always find that that matters, that you're a little bit faster when there are fewer choices and so on. And that actually means if you think about it in these terms that these choices are very close. So, so they can only be, have an influence if they were very close to the threshold of the sigmoid, because if they're, deeply inhibited, they shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. they, they matter if, if they were almost ready to be activated. And so the premise that we find to be realistic are that the this, this system is tuning itself all the time to make all sources of information very close to, to an, a detection, detection instability. So that would be an interesting thing to understand, you know, how is that done and, and why is that? And the truth is we haven't been able to study that. Um, I, it is fascinating to me. It's, you know, it's very. It's a question of how to how to get empirical constraints on that. I think it has to do with some kind of robustness, um, and I think that has possibly something to do with self-organized criticality. There would be some some way of how the, the system uh, does that. I know that some people look at that in a more structural way. So for instance, people look at um, why you have these uh, fractal-looking uh, neural networks everywhere. Um, and, and they provide a certain kind of robustness, but that's more really about the resting state, about uh, just sort of uh, uh, homeostasis. So how to do that for a function, you know, after, if you, if you uh, give a, let's say you take a, a human observer and uh, give him a couple of buttons to press and, you know, does that, and then initially a re reaction time will be quite long if there are 20 buttons. But if it turns out after some time that it's only three buttons that ever show up, then, you know, you're tuning, you're doing some tuning in a way, and then you suddenly have a three-choice reaction time, you know, and you see the monkeys and so on. So that would be the kind of processes that one would want to look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the audience? I tried to raise my hand. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Please go ahead. Yes. Hello, Gregor. Benjamin Hello. here. The other any any <laughs> uh, yes. talk. very very inspiring. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask. So I'm fascinated by this um, attractor idea, right? And and you said, look, you know, there's this neuron, and this bump goes up, and the other one goes down. What does this mean for the neuron, right? Is do you assume that this is more a network phenomenon, or would you say mm -hmm. a single neuron basically tries to implement a certain attractor? And if yes, what is the neuron actually trying to do? No, so, so uh, all of these are actually population representations. I, I just didn't go, go into that. So in some cases, we've really done the mapping to neurophysiology. And then you can say it's always small populations of neurons that have that functional significance that are connected mm -hmm. that way. And so the uh, interaction uh, pattern is that in small populations, essentially you have some kind of families that certain neurons tend to be excitatorily coupled, maybe you know, laterally, but could also be through some loops. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with everyone else, they are either not coupled or inhibitorily coupled. And that makes that self-organization property. See this, right? There's a, usually during development, there's a predecessor, right? That yes. then splits up in many cells. So there's yes. many cells with the same genetic background. Right. And these seem to have a same, similar tuning behavior yes. and a, a stronger connectivity within each other, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so, it, as you know, it's uh, generic in a way, in, certainly in cortex and a lot of subcortical structures that the uh, overall um, lateral or recurrent connectivity is uh, a function of how metrically similar your connectivity to the surfaces is, you know, the tuning to input or to output. So, more, for instance, motor cortex is very clear that those neurons that have more similar tuning are overall more excitatorily coupled. 
And so I would say that that's sort of the substrate that very likely supports these kind of functions. We've been able to make these links only in a few cases. I, I've been involved in work in motor cortex and premotor cortex, and then Dirk Young has done this in the visual cortex. Uh, but I would say it's roughly consistent with a lot of things that we know about other kind of representations. But what does this mean for what a single neuron tries to do, right? Like, because op uh, at the end, it breaks down to some type of learning rule or a yes. single objective function. Yeah, so in a, in a way, <clears throat> so it's a little more, uh, even a little bit more abstract. So, for instance, you, you, you learn, learn something, right? So you either yeah. program a learning rule or some type of optimization function. So, so what? I mean, so, I, uh, first, I should maybe say that I'm talking here about these low dimensional representations and we actually think uh, that those might be really the substrate for this autonomous processing. Uh, while they're also in a way high dimensional representations. So if you think of much more complex kind of networks that exist for instance in the individual stream or uh, that uh, you know, hippocampal cells are connected to, they um, would do something slightly different. And so in these different cases, there, there's a different uh, significance of learning. Uh, so in these, these low dimensional cases, I would say learning is really just, uh, it occurs maybe in development and it is a sort of tuning, uh, sharpening or broadening. We, we do a lot of develop, developmental work where we, we have something we call the spatial position hypothesis, how over, de over development these kernels be, gets to be sharper. Uh, but I don't think that we're, we're not postulating that the learning sets up the networks. Actually, uh, if anything, it's skill learning. It's very long-term learning. While in these other domains, that's where um, I think the neurons play quite a different role. So for instance, if you, let's say the only other attractor network that is very clear so is the Hopfield network, right? In, in the mm -hmm. Hopfield network, you have a connectivity for a specific pattern. And that's why it's thought of as a model of memory that is, there you have to know exactly who excites whom and who inhibits whom in order to stabilize one particular pattern. And so in, so in that pattern, the significance of the neural connections and of the neurons is quite different. It's really to encode in that pattern um, something specific you know, about your experience. Well, in, in our uh, idea, the neuron is just contributing to sampling. So the fact that it's a population is probably just some form of robustness requirement. Uh, could, you know, in, in fact, if you, for instance, I think you know the motor cortex, motor cortex, you have these broad tuning curves to movement parameters. And if you think through that, then that actually means that in these fields, the, the neuron isn't actually localized. A, a neuron is sort of spread out across the field. You, you, you could think of the neuron contributes its whole tuning curve. And you have a broad tuning curve, then the neuron is distributed. So we're actually, it's just a loose talk to say one location in the field is one neuron. It's actually a, a transformation to a different space where the neurons provide basis functions. So like the radio basis function picture, right? They provide basis functions and we're talking about how the, the basis functions build the fields. And therefore the significance of neurons is to sample that. And you can actually sample with very few neurons a field like that. You could even sample a field with 10 neurons because you don't have to represent any complicated activation bedding. You just want to make a bump, a single bump. So 10 neurons would mean 10 weight factors of 10 basis functions. So, the, so the, I would say for us in, in this domain, it's a very different uh, picture than for uh, a lot of what, what people do in, in, in deep learning and so on, where they think of the units of representation being these vectors, you know, where, where everything in the vector matters. All right, thank, thanks. May, may I make a remark? Yes. <clears throat> I'm, uh, of course, very pleased to see that there is a very thriving environment there in uh, Bochum, where I once was, as you, uh, as you know. Um, you know, the, the general approach that you are following, <clears throat> which is very much in the tradition of Hermann Haken and the synergetics era and so on. Yes. Dynamic systems, uh, cross-coupling, stability, instability. Yeah is very different from uh, the, the uh, currently leading neural paradigm, you know, uh, machine learning right. and so on. So uh, my question is, how do you, self, uh, how do you see yourself um, as, as a uh, direction of, of research 
in the community? Uh, do you feel isolated? Uh, are there, I mean, is this uh, a, a thriving community worldwide? Um, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> Interesting question. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a struggle sometimes, uh, although I think, so, you know, the different communities in which we have different impacts. So, so psychologists, now do behavior experiments, are very interested in this way of thinking. Um, because really psychology has moved away from these input output questions for a long time, right? I mean, reaction time is really, I mentioned that because it's so easy, but uh, you know, that is sort of ancient. And uh, they're interested in much more complex tasks and, and tasks that require this kind of autonomy. And there's no language really to deal with that. And the classic, you know, connections thinking would be the psychologist version, let's say, of the feed forward networks are, is very limited that way. And as you know, there was this big debate in psychology between symbolic and connectionist thinking that's now considered you know, ancient, but it wasn't, wasn't resolved. It's, it's not that, uh, that the connections network would actually have ever achieved the famous flexibility that symbolic processing achieves. So there, I, I actually think we have a real chance to give neural grounding. I mean, we're not doing symbol manipulation, but we're achieving functions that people always argued need symbols for. And, and so that's, that's where I think we will find an audience. We do find an audience. It's, it's more an issue of psychologists understanding the math and, and you know, some, some of the modeling issues. In the technical domain, it's much more complicated because um, people are very impressed with the intelligent filter. I would say the deep networks are really just intelligent filters because it's very practical. You, you know, in the old AI, uh, the problem was to get sensory information into the system, to link it to the world. And now they have this tool to do that. And it's very seductive then to just take the output of the network and have your normal algorithm, maybe helped by some probabilistic methods, and, uh, and then uh, have conventional computing and, and you just use the neural network for that one task. And um, when that works, you know, engineers are always pragmatic. When it works, they're happy and they have to think harder, or design something more complex, but it's, it's, it's more principles, you know, they're not necessarily so interested in. And the deep networks, you know, when, when you say, but the deep network can't do this or can't do that, it's never true because uh, you can always make it do that by just giving it the right learning material and then it will learn that thing. So to convince engineers that uh, it is useful to be so radically neural and pervasively neural is not so easy. And actually what we're currently doing, that, so you, you, you know, Yulia Sandemiskaya who moved to Zurich and is now actually at Intel. Um, and she's, she's pushing it very much that way. It's um, to say, well, ultimately it will be embedded systems. If you, if you want to have a drone that has an intelligent computer on board, you cannot uh, have that computing power that is required to run the deep networks with these algorithms. And, and you want to have a, ultimately maybe an artificial insect. Mm -hmm. And that has, you know, insects actually do a lot of cognition. Really? Uh, it's actually amazing what they do. You know? They mm -hmm. navigate in space, they make decisions, selections, you know, they mate and so on. And so uh, that will be a vision where we're an entry point. And um, still it's a struggle because it's so much harder. You know, it's just uh, simple things are harder uh, than just writing a piece of code. And so um, it will always be around examples that, that, uh, that are special that way. More of X um, paradox you are talking yes. about. Exactly. You are doing exactly. the simple things which are so difficult. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Gregor, I see that there is a question from John, John McCasley, who happens to be, you know, your your predecessor in, as, a, as a representative. So we're please, having ah, a right. mini uh, Bochum reunion here. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> uh, to, um, written question. Oh, uh, Christoph, yeah. Gregor, question is, um, uh, you know, all of these phrases about cognition, uh, like turning things around in your mind and taking a different perspective and... Uh, uh, all, all the rest which indicate that our, our actual thinking about things and cognition uh, involves actually separating our representation of objects from yes. the sensory perspective. And so I'm kind of, I mean, the, con the very concrete question is, uh, would your algorithms uh, be able to detect uh, to the left of uh, type concepts um, if the the concept of to the left of with was with respect to um, 
uh, on your 2D visual field, actually objects which had three-dimensional you know, rotation capabilities. And so that the actual uh, uh, task was to detect properties uh, which were uh, resistant to rotation around in, in three dimension. And I, I'm asking this yeah. sort of detailed question because of its sort of general significance with respect to the uh, idea of actually the brain creating a detached representation, uh, which enables it to look at it in different ways and, uh, and have it not rigidly attached, which it looks like to a certain extent your representations are to the uh, sensory input. So <clears throat> it's actually a very good question. Uh, it's it connected to a, a whole tr tradition in cognitive science that has to do with embodiment. It's actually a, an older conception of embodiment to, to uh, ask how we do these more abstract things. I think you're sort of saying, you know, can I, isn't it true that I can do more abstract forms of perspective taking, for instance, that are not really on the retina or you know, some, in, in this very low level form. And um, that is actually one of the, the, uh, our motivations. Uh, we are consistent with that tradition in the sense that we are ultimately aiming to show that you could do, you know, you could think about the economy by saying, uh, using essentially metaphorical thinking, saying you know, the economy is moving forward or is hitting an obstacle or it's going up or, you know, and that you know, the, was using spatial metaphor and using maybe motion detection or motion representation on a space, a more abstract kind of space that isn't directly linked to your visual array. And, and in fact, the machinery that I was hinting at is exactly able to do that. I didn't explain that in, in theory. It doesn't actually have to be, uh, attached to the retina. In fact, this example I showed you about the mental map formation is an example like that, where you, you create your own space, a space in which you arrange things and, and a space on which you then can operate. That space could be you know, something like the price structure in a market, for instance, or, or wild things like that. So we believe actually that that might be a leverage into, into higher cognition that, that is more disembodied, more abstract. Uh, and that would use these same basic concepts, you know, the grounding in sensory motor is, is in other words, not grounding really in, in concrete sensory motor fields, but has that same principle. Mm -hmm. and, and the earlier, so th there was a debate in cognitive science about that. And, and there are people uh, who very much promoted this kind of idea based more on, on uh, an, you know, for instance, on an analysis of metaphor. Uh, there's some famous books about that, and I can point you to some of that. Um, there are people who argued against it. Those were uh, essentially people who think of grammar and, and you know, that, that the brain represents abstract rules and, and, and is really categorically different from this more metric uh, lower level things. So, oh, so was one of our time when I say we were working on compositionality, we're exactly trying to see that if these sort of you know, space time continuous methods can approach something that looks as flexible as symbol processing, which you know, compositionality is one of the holy grails of the more classical um, approach to, to cognition, where you would say, I can make an infinite of um, combinations of, of concepts and the meaning emerges then from their combination. How, you know, how could we do things like that with this language? We're working on that. So we, 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 we hope that it's consistent with that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions from the audience? Um, I don't see the, any other questions. So, you know, I assume that uh, Gregor, you, you have been told that uh, you, you, you have been recorded and the presentation will be right. loaded, no uploaded in, yeah. in our YouTube channel. So people yeah. will have a chance to, even people that who missed the talk will have a chance to, to review this. Uh, That's great. Very nice talk. Okay, so it's, it's, it's exactly four o'clock. So, you know, we are in, a, according to the Italian style, we are exactly on time on schedule. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you for having me. And thanks Thank for your you questions. For being with us. And uh, so next, next, next week, we will skip it. We will not have any seminar next week. So we will go to the 24th of July and uh, we will have a, a completely different uh, type of talk with different background by Ivan Gladich. So, you know, I hope that to, to, to see you there. Uh, I'm really happy to join. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, thank you. for joining us and uh, 
Bye bye. To the next. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Bye.